Welcome back to Stanford Legal, where we look at the cases, questions, conflicts, and legal stories that affect us all every day. I'm Pam Carlin, along with Joe Bankman. Uh, Welcome uh, again, uh, Joe and Mike. You know, we're talking about Elon Musk and strong personalities that aren't going to follow a playbook. And that brings to mind, to me, a little bit of the political dimension, both because we see these this new breed of CEO more willing to take political positions. And, of course, we're thinking of somebody else that doesn't go by the playbook uh, that tweets a lot. Uh, what issues are raised in that, Mike? You've got – I know that you're a former general counsel of LinkedIn, and LinkedIn CEO is well known as a kind of a stalwart in the, uh, I think, liberal causes, democratic causes. Does that raise issues? I think one of the challenges for CEOs, particularly technology CEOs, given the association in Silicon Valley with general left-leaning causes, is what issues to weigh in on and what issues to stay back on. And the challenge with that for CEOs is there are many of these political issues that have nothing to do with the core business that the company's in, but they have a lot to do with how employees and customers care about the values and the culture of these companies and what they mean to society. And when you confront issues that most recently in immigration is a perfect example where after the announcements from the Trump administration related to restricting the DACA program and also restricting travel from certain Muslim-majority countries, in addition to certain attorneys general, you saw technology companies take very public positions either in social media or actually filing briefs in support of various actions around the country in order to take action. Some of those had a business impact in that some of those companies had employees that were affected. But more importantly, it's how do you send a message to your employees and your customers that you care about these issues because they're important from a culture and value standpoint. And for a CEO to get alignment with their board on what is okay to talk about when it's not a core business issue and what is not okay to talk about and in what forum is one of the new challenges that CEOs are confronting every morning when they wake up because the social media universe allows communication with millions instantly. Can you give us some examples of companies that have done the right or the wrong thing on that? Well, you know, it's hard to know what's the right and what's the wrong thing. It'll depend upon your perspective, but there, there are lots of interesting examples. So, for example, Delta Airlines uh, eliminates certain affiliation relationships with the NRA, and you have some of its customers going yay, and meanwhile, it loses financial benefits uh, at its, you know, uh, main headquarters hub uh, in Atlanta because uh, legislators in Georgia have a different view of the NRA. You then have employees here at Google, for example, uh, objecting to work that Google's been doing with the Department of Defense. Uh, and you've got employees, um, I believe, at Salesforce objecting to work that's been done with ICE. Uh, and yeah, well, there was the, there was also the airlines all announcing because the flight attendants were upset about it in part that they would no longer transport the kids who'd been separated from their parents at the border. A- absolutely. And I think this, this fits into one of the research programs that we've got going at the Rock Center – which is operating around the theme of, of employee activism. The reality is, especially here in Silicon Valley, where the market for highly talented computer science types is extraordinarily tight, people are competing. Companies are competing not simply on cash and options. They're competing on workplace environment. Well, that means foosball tables, bean ba- beanbag chairs, and also the quality of food – and whether you feel politically comfortable in the culture of the corporation. So if a corporation is trying to hire very talented computer science types, and if that aspect of the labor market in the valley leans left of center, it's profit maximizing to create an environment that also supports hiring people who are left of center who want to work in that kind of a culture. And Mike, do you think that's right? Absolutely. And I think one of the challenges for that marketplace dynamic that Joe described is when a company takes a political position on one of these issues, they're at risk of alienating half of their employees and at least half their customers. Many Silicon Valley companies, while they struggle for talent here in Silicon Valley, also maintain facilities in states like Texas, Alabama, Nebraska, and places where perhaps the political leanings are different. And for a CEO and a management team to maintain a consistent message around culture and values that allows that company to compete in the marketplace for talent and do so when you have geographically dispersed populations can be a challenge. 
This is Stanford Legal, and today we're talking about entrepreneurs, visionaries, and the law with our colleagues Joe Grunfest and Mike Callahan. You mentioned the Rock Center a minute ago, Joe. Tell our, our listeners a little bit about, this is Stanford University Center. What do you do there? And if they wanted to get a taste of it, how could they do that? Well, you know, what we try to do is focus on issues that are relevant to the role of the corporation in modern American economy and also in society. So we've got a program that looks at the corporation and society. We've got a program that looks at technology and innovation. There are a bunch of things that we do in the international sphere. Uh, we do a set of events. We do a lot of research. An example, and we've got an upcoming event with John Carrier, who's the author of Bad Blood. And we're going to be talking about Theranos, the Theranos fraud, uh, and the implications that that really has for the ecosystem here in Silicon Valley, which if you step back for a second and look at it, the number of situations that we've had here in the Valley that are outright frauds is really remarkably small relative to the total number of companies that have been formed and the total amount of dollars that's actually been raised. So we're going to do a whole exploration of how does this ecology work and also how did Elizabeth Holmes get away with this? It's and pretty remarkable. If, if somebody wanted to be a part of that, how do they do it? Can they just Google Rock Center in Stanford, find out when it is, and it's online or you got a web version of it? Absolutely. So the Rock Center website has a listing of all our upcoming events, including the event that Joe just mentioned and several others that we have planned in the fall. So one of the questions I have for you is the, the corporation seems to be changing dramatically what its role in American society is. And, you know, how much of that is a function of the economy and how much of it is the function of the kind of breakdown of things outside of corporations, breakdown of the political process? I think that, at least in the companies that I've worked at, the feeling of inability to make traction in Washington on important areas that people care about has led to people looking closer to home to their corporations to be the ones to take the leading position and take action where they can to help drive a cause forward. And that is definitely a shift. And look, look I, the CEO of Apple has publicly said that corporations are going to have to step up because corporations are generally functional and our government is not. You have a look at where health care in the United States come from comes from a huge percentage of, of people in America get their health care through their corporation. Um, there, there are so many areas in which, for better or worse, the employer is now being looked to to fulfill a role that people had traditionally thought of as being part of the state, that this is something else that we're going to wind up looking at at the Rock Center. And that kind of takes us back to Elon Musk in a way, which is if we're, if we're kind of counting on the corporation to do a lot of the things that we relied on other institutions to do earlier, it puts more pressure on the head of the corporation to be statesmanlike in a way. And that takes us, I guess, Mike, back to you, which is when you're the general counsel and you start to see the, he the CEO of a corporation or a high-level executive kind of coloring outside the lines – how do you handle that? I think it presents an interesting corporate governance challenge for both the general counsel and for the board, which is to try to break down that challenge in two ways. First, is the activity something that is related to the business, like the tweet we talked about with the, with the going private situation, which would lead you to a different set of how you're going to deal with this. But I think more importantly, a board needs to understand and decide, is the risk of a CEO who acts in a way that may un be me unpredictable worth the trade-off to the upside, which is all of the great accomplishments that they're able to bring in terms of product and innovation. And that tension is a very real one in Silicon Valley. And finding that right balance of how much off-field activity can you tolerate for all the goodness that you get. Uh, 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 great answer, spoken like uh, a, a true statesman. Uh, I, I think we should remind our listeners that the way this works in, in corporate governance is it's actually the board that appoints the CEO. So ultimately, just like an employee has a boss, the CEO has a boss, and, and that boss is a board. I want to end with asking you guys for a prediction on this case. What's going to happen here? Well, that's actually easy. The case is going to settle, and the only interesting question is, what will the terms of the settlement be? Well, and how? Uh, and and what's the interesting answer for that? Well, you know, you've got you've got two cases that's going on. You've got the um, uh, private party litigation, and that's going to be settled for dollar amounts. 
And for a variety of reasons, uh, I would predict that the dollar amounts will not be huge. Uh, and that's related to the way you calculate damages in these cases, the relatively short period during which the um, uh, you know, alleged misrepresentation was alive in the market. The more interesting issue is what will it take to settle with the SEC? The SEC has authority to seek something that's known as an officer and director bar, which in theory could prevent Elon Musk from acting as a, a director of the company or as CEO. There's precedent for this having to do with Martha Stewart, where for a period of time, Martha Stewart uh, was subject to a bar and she was in effect the chief creative officer, but she had to stay a million miles away from the company's books and records and she couldn't talk about the financials. She could talk about how to you know, do a quesadilla. Get All your right. glue guns out. All right, get your glue guns out, but can't talk to you about the stock price. Now I'm going to uh, – what do you think, Mike? We're just about out of time, but I want you to be able to – to say if you think that's right. I think that the, this Tesla and the board and Mr. Musk will work their way through this instant situation, to Joe's point, and the company is going to continue to go on and grow, and we'll continue to see this kind of turbulence on social media. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Mike and Joe, and thanks to our listeners for joining us on Stanford Legal here on Sirius XM Insight 121.